Is it possible you could be driving in your car and then suddenly compelled to turn down a road you've never seen before? You have the sensation that something is pulling you, drawing you to a clearing where a strange aircraft hovers near the ground. Aliens greet you, call you by name. They seem to know everything about you, but for some reason, you're not afraid. You board the spaceship, fly off to another planet, and then later return safely to Earth. Good evening and welcome to From Beyond. I'm Joey Travolta. Stories of alien contact seem unbelievable, and the contactees are usually passed off as cons or crazy. But should they be dismissed so easily? Tonight we'll take a closer look. My present position of thinking, line of thinking, is that we've been visited by extraterrestrial entities for a long time, maybe as long as our history and maybe even as long as, as humanity has been on this planet. And maybe we were brought here by them. It's a long, ongoing, extended phenomenon. It's not an event that happened recently. We only have the modern wave of it being reported at the present time. I'm absolutely convinced, like almost all scientists are, that there's life in the universe, you know, teeming with intelligent life. And I believe that it can get here, and it could happen any day, and it doesn't have to even be what we've been experiencing here. You know, for example, Jacques Vallée says, UFOs are real, they are not alien spacecraft. Okay, that's what he, that, those are the two fundamentals, I think, of his position. They're real, they're not alien spacecraft. Let's say he's right, but maybe tomorrow, the alien spacecraft will be here. And, and I think it's inevitable, in fact, that, that's, I guess, my fundamental point here. It is inevitable that we will contact alien life someday. The only question is, you know, when and when will it openly occur? Maybe it's already, of course, occurred secretly, but it, when will it openly occur? There are really two kinds of contactee subcultures, in a sense. There was the one of, that began in Southern California in the 1950s and went on until it petered out sometime in the 60s. It was composed in great part of people who claimed actual physical contact with extraterrestrials. And they provided photographs and films of what were represented as spaceships, but which were all too clearly small objects, models. The belief was that there were selected Earthlings who were in regular communication with space people. They were often called space brothers. They were angelic beings, usually with long blonde hair and uh, almost sort of androgynous features, really kind of angels in space suits, basically. And that the universe was densely populated, mostly by advanced, benevolent civilizations with an occult philosophy. There was also belief that there was a minority of civilizations in the universe that were demonic, that were really evil, and that they had earthly allies. And the good space people were, among other things, trying to stop the designs of the bad space people. And also, the good space people were trying to prevent earthlings from blowing themselves up with atomic bombs. During the late 40s and early 50s, as many people are aware, uh, we were going through a great technological uh, stage of advancement here uh, in this country and around the world. Uh, we were coming to the advent of the nuclear age, and uh, we were rapidly progressing in our scientific capabilities. However, we seem to be uh, very slow in our sociological parallel of that scientific advancement. When these craft came to visit us, uh, visit us in the late 50, uh, pardon me, in the late 40s, they were greatly concerned with what we were doing atomically uh, to this planet. Uh, we were testing our uh, hydrogen bombs in, on the surface, uh, in the atmosphere, and we were, for the first time, set up in a condition where we literally had the capability of destroying this planet. And uh, some of these crafts and these people came to inform us that we need to be very aware of what we were doing with this technology and through our ignorance that we wouldn't destroy ourselves in the process. This is one of many reasons why they came to visit us uh, during that time frame. 
and continue to visit us to this day. People like Adamski, George Van Tassel, Orfeo Angelucci, Daniel Fry, some of the other leading players in the drama of 1950s contact e-movement, were their allies on Earth. Adamski's followers called him Earth's Cosmic Ad Ambassador. And these were the prophets. These were the Earthlings who were here to spread the message to all who would hear. And these guys came from a wide variety of backgrounds and varying levels of sincerity. None of them was telling the literal truth. But some of them were fudging the truth or in, more likely inventing out of whole cloth out of what were basically benign intentions. They had a sincere and mostly benevolent message. You know, people should be nice to each other. They shouldn't blow each other up. You know, these things that you, you know, all human beings are brothers and sisters. I mean, things that, you know, you're not going to disagree with and that, that would be good if everybody believed and acted on. But at the same time, there were other guys who were just sort of uh, veteran swindlers, con artists, sociopaths, people who just saw it as a new way to, to hustle something. Only as the 70s turned into the 80s and the 90s have we now all become convinced, or most of us, that UFOs are real extraterrestrial spacecraft. Um, and so, but you know, why has that occurred? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think it should be investigated. I think you can speculate along many lines. One is that produced the fact that there were UFO sightings, just kept occurring. I mean, just reinforced this thing in the public's mind. Oh, yeah, UFOs might be real, might be extraterrestrial spacecraft. The space program is the second factor, obviously. Got us all interested in space. The third is that astronomy has become more of an interesting discipline with satellites and, and you know, space telescopes and all those kinds, of, and radio telescopes searching for extraterrestrial life with Carl Sagan. So that's a whole other area. Fourth area, movies, science fiction, of course. You know, talk, you know the 1950s thing starting it. Because before that, science fiction was pulp novels, amazing stories. And it was, it was a small segment, I think, of the population. But then in the 50s, it burgeoned. So I think all those things enter into it. And I think that the reason the public believes, the fundamental reason, is that it's reasonable to believe. You know, that, there, that we all think that there's life out there. And that, hey, why not? Yeah, you know, that, is that essentially. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. So why not? Why, you know, and the only difference, in fact, that the public has with scientists is that. Scientists think you, uh, alien life exists and it's all far away. And the public thinks alien life exists and it, part of it's here. George Adamski, founder of the Contact Movement, enlightened messenger, con artist, respected researcher, liar. He's been called all of these things. The controversy began in 1952 when Adamski, middle-aged and leading seemingly an uneventful life, emerged from a California desert claiming to have met a spaceman. George Adamski was, uh, along with George Van Tassel, the most influential figure in the early contactee movement. And uh, whereas uh, Van Tassel was claiming, at least initially, channeled messages from extraterrestrials, Adamski claimed to have met them physically, beginning with an incident in the desert of Southern California on November 20th, 1952, which supposedly was witnessed from some considerable distance by six of his most trusted associates. And Adamski uh, wrote uh, several books. Um, he wrote, he first really came on the scene by co-authoring with Desmond Leslie, who was an Irish occultist, a book called Flying Saucers Have Landed, which came out in 1953. And this was the first full account of Adamski's initial meeting with a Venusian named Orthon. George Adamski could be considered really the uh, pioneer in the UFO field. Uh, he was by no means the only person who had taken uh, photographs of UFOs, but he was one of the very few who went out publicly and uh, submitted his photographs to uh, many agencies, uh, many different uh, laboratories, and um, really brought this subject out into the forefront of, uh, of investigations into why these crafts are visiting us and the message that they bring. And um, 
primarily he started taking uh, first pictures in the late 40s. He had a number of contacts in the middle 1950s in front of witnesses in which this craft landed in the desert and the occupants, human beings, came out and uh, they communicated for minutes and then uh, they flew back off into their craft into space. And this repeated itself many times during the 50s and early 60s. This is one of the few surviving pictures from the original contact in November of 1952. And you can just see the shape of the scout craft or bell-shaped craft as it comes above the hill out in desert center as it's taking off into space. This was after Mr. Adamski had face-to-face -face contact with the human being who had come out as the pilot of this craft. The photographs were created. In fact, uh, at one point, um, somebody who was close to Adamski, a guy named Gerald Baker, actually saw the model. Baker was a guy who, a young guy who was close to Adamski in 52 and 53 and, and personally witnessed many of the things that went on and later, you know, spilled the beans to a, to a skeptical ufologist, James Mosley. He also said that the initial contact, the November 20th, 1952 incident, was carefully rehearsed before they went out into the desert. And everybody knew what he was supposed to say. And yet, it's, in the end, we really will never know exactly what happened. You know, I don't think it's the, the literal truth of Adamski's claims is in any way defensible. Those things simply didn't happen. But something happened. You know, something human happened. And, and human behavior can be as enigmatic as the most mysterious UFO events. And I think that in Adamski we're dealing with a human mystery. It's, it's not only the mystery of Adamski's real motivation, but also the, the mystery of what happens to you when you enter some kind of milieu in which miraculous things are claimed and maybe even experienced on some level. Coming up, more stories of alleged alien contact. In 1977, William Herman had several opportunities to photograph strange craft, craft that trailed airplanes and flew in erratic patterns over Charleston, South Carolina. On March 18th, he was out looking for these UFOs. When a disc suddenly appeared, it swooped toward him, paralyzing him with a beam of blue light. When he regained consciousness three hours later, he was alone in a field 15 miles from home. He, the, he and his wife were at home uh, after supper one time when a neighbor lady came to the door to boil a cup of sugar. And as his wife looked out over the neighbor lady's head, she saw the pinkish orange light, which she recognizes now too. She's seen it enough times, she knows what it is. It's Bill's friend. So she says, Bill, your, your friend is out here. And he came and looked. He says, by golly, it is. He said, I think I'll get my jacket and go out and take a look, better look at it. It was flying the, what they have now recognized as a peculiar triangular pattern along the power lines that run down the Ashley River there. And so he got his jacket on and the binoculars, put them around his neck, and walked out the door in his little trailer park where his trailer home was parked and across a, a shallow nearly dry, di damp ditch and up onto a railroad track that ran about uh, 15, 10 or 15 feet above the level of the trailer park. He got up on the track and started walking down the track, watching it flying these triangular patterns over the power lines ahead of him, probably two or three miles away, which is not in the air, that's not very far. And he, he had his binoculars out, looking at the object when it dropped out of the binoculars. It dropped like a stone. and. He lowered the binoculars to see where it crashed, and he saw it just over the water of the Ashley River at, at water level, and he thought, oh my God, it's crashed right into the river. When at that point, it, it, it approached it and filled the sky like that. And it came so fast and so big and, and, and so close, he shied back like that and caught his foot on the rail of the railroad track and began to fall. And he put his hands out to see what, you know, there's a jagged rocks down there, you can get skinned up pretty good to see what he was falling on, and he noticed he was not falling, he was rising away from the rocks, and the reeds, tall grass, was blowing away from him in, in, in waves, 
and he looked back and he's above the railroad track and he's going up in a blue beam of light. I was about like this, just looking at it, and then I just fell back like this. Yeah. And, and, and to uh, the this point, point, I stopped falling. Oh, that's why I couldn't understand, because I there. like this, and then the light was all the way around me, and I put, went to push my hand through, and I couldn't. You know, it, I couldn't move. Uh, yeah, right at this spot. Right at this spot. Because the object filled the area from that bush to that bush. It just filled the area. The light came from the, looked like it came from the edge. Mm -hmm. it didn't come. At first I thought it came from the bottom. But after the hypnosis and after the recall, I realized that it didn't come so much from the bottom as it did from the edge of the object. Uh, I see. You know, the rim. Yeah. Around the rim. He said that the, the light felt it like a uh, um, uh, a low voltage electrical current, just like that, a, 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 a cyclic tugging up the beam of light until, and, and he looked up, and it looked like it went into a cloud. He, the beam was so coherent, he put his arm out, and the arm went out of the beam, and he could pull it back in. It's in the beam again. He didn't touch anything going through, and and he rose up, and when he got to the end of the cloud, he passed out and woke up on an examining table, uh, and that's uh, the time in between. He didn't remember anything. Of course, when he first came back, he didn't really remember a whole lot of that either. That took time to develop the, the details by stressing his memory to get it. The first thing I remember looking at was this bar of lights flashing slowly above my head. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what the bar of lights look like. Laying on a table, mm -hmm. your head is up here, yeah. and you're looking up. Mm -hmm. You see blue, green, red, blue, green. Green, blue, red, green, blue. You know, back and forth. Uh -huh. Flash, 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 flash. And it was doing this. And the slower this went, the more conscious I became. The more uh -huh. able to wake up and look and look around me. Uh -huh. when I, what I saw when I woke up, it's like, it's, it's hard to really sometimes grasp, but it was like, I thought in my mind there were doctors, or I'd been hurt, I, was falling when I, I remembered the train tracks. I didn't remember the object as much as I remembered falling with the train tracks. And I remember falling, and I thought, oh, I must have broken my back, I must have, somebody must have found me, and I'm in a hospital, uh, you know. And all these thoughts were racing in my head until the three people that were standing there turned and looked at me. Mm -hmm. And I had noticed that before they had turned, they were looking at this bar of lights flashing on the ceiling. And they were looking at a box that seemed to be off to the side at my feet. Uh -huh. And the box was connected to the bed. You could tell it was connected by wires to the bed I was laying on or the table or whatever it was. And when they turned and looked at me, it was like all kinds of emotions just surged to the surface at once. Now this is a sketch of what I believe I saw standing next to my bed or table or whatever you want to call it. Four and a half feet tall, with a red garment, looked like a pullover jumpsuit, not not pajamas, more military looking. And uh, the eyes were spaced apart like ovals with circles inside, dark circles. And the uh, uh, occupant, when they like when they told me to get up, and it was okay. I heard the voice, but I did not see the lips move. I heard it as clear as you hear my voice. You heard in English. In English. Okay. It was in English. Yeah. Perfect English. Not not accented, not deep, not high, just English. Mm -hmm. I felt afraid because I didn't know what was going on. I felt like this is totally foreign to everything I believe. Uh, what is going on here? Why am I here? What is this? Mm. All these thoughts going through my head, and all he could say was, don't be afraid. <laughs> you know, it's like all my emotions and fears were just tossed aside by the comfort and assurance of what he said to me. Mm -hmm. Just don't be afraid, have no fear or something to that effect. Uh, come, the time is limited or something about like that. Now more stories of alleged alien contact. The object itself was like a, like a round pancake shape. Uh -huh with a dome on top and a dome on the bottom. Right. But it looked sealed in metal. In other words, it, you didn't see no windows or no uh -huh. holes or nothing. It moved in a circle above, I'd say about 800 to 1,000, maybe 1,500 feet above the ground. Mm -hmm. 
and it moved in uh, not as, as obvious triangles, but kind of in a flowing, graceful, dynamical fashion. Oh. I mean, just sliding in across the sky, you uh -huh. know. Not doing anything that would give it an impression that it would lose control. Uh -huh. it, in spite of its erratic behavior, you could tell it was in total control of itself. I mean, there was just, it was, it was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful displays of aerodynamics I've ever seen, mm -hmm. as far as being involved in this subject. So you tried to take a picture? I tried. The first shot, I believe the first shot I took came out empty sky. It was moving so fast. Uh -huh. I mean, it would go up like this and come back like this. Come around like that. And just watching it was, you know, it was hard. Uh -huh. Because when it would go that way, I'd run across the field. And I'm trying to get it in a viewfinder. Mm -hmm. And I took about four or five shots like that. Uh -huh. And I believe two or three of them came out. And two came out empty sky. They uh, took him to a control panel and sat him down in one of the seats. His escort, who is speaking to him in his language, he hears it in his language, he hears it in his ears, just like surround sound. And he, he tells him, uh, uh, look, and they pointed to the screen, and another ship, just like the one they were in, joined them. And then the two ships went rapidly again south over continents or over countries and continents topography geography changing just like it's unrolling rapidly and they and they approached ground again the surface down over argentina they took him to again to an underwater facility in the rio sal which runs out of a big freshwater lake a, a, a big lake in northern argentina and the river runs for, through santa fe a little town not such a little town, a big town of santa fe and his, his escort standing beside him. Now, the escort's not buckled into anything. He's just standing there, and, and Herman is sitting in a seat, but he's not fastened in either. And the, the, the craft he's in tilts down at an angle and goes into the water and goes under the water. And, uh, and, and there's no inertial change to him. He feels no inertial changes, and his partner's still standing there beside him. And the partner touches him on the shoulder and says, we were observed over Santa Fe. There will be reports in the paper tomorrow about UFOs, and uh, uh, they went to the underwater facility, and and the being explained to him that they they installed this facility to carry out certain hydrodynamic tests in our water because our water was different from their water. On the way back, they showed me uh, the reactions of people observing the craft, and he said, "Walk over here," and I walked up to the it looked like a cross between an open window and a television set. Uh -huh. it, didn't, it looked like a TV you know, it was like this, but it looked like an open window that I could just stick my hand through it. Is what it looked like. And I looked through the monitor and you could see there was a road, there was trees on both sides of the road, mm -hmm. and it looked like an orange grove or, mm -hmm. or some kind of bird field. Mm -hmm. And there was a road running adjacent to it. And there was two cars put over. One was a penal station wagon, a low penal station wagon, and the other one was a Buick Electra. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there was a lady in the pool and there was a man in the Buick. Mm -hmm. And the lady was standing outside the passenger door looking up like this. Mm -hmm. And the man was just standing there like this. And I'm standing inside this object looking at that. And it was like it zoomed up on the people. And he said, now watch what happens. The one that was next to me, he said, watch what happens when we move closer. The minute he said that, you saw the girl. It seemed illogical that you could tell it was out of fear. She ran around the front of her car and jumped on the passenger side, reached over there and locked her door. He did, the man standing up, he just calmly, looked like he was trying to keep his cool, just sat down and got in the car and mm -hmm. locked the door. Now, he says, now watch her. She's going to hold the lock down. And the only indication of any hostility was what he said next when he said, and he says, a foolish gesture if we wish to direct observe. After the examination and they're es escorting around the ship, they, as they're starting to walk through the ship, his, his host, his guide, uh, said that they would like him. He said, we, uh, I wonder if you could uh, make some arrangement with your government to release uh, uh, a damaged vehicle and one of our damaged ships and the bodies of our people. And he said, oh, I don't have any connections like that. There's nothing I can do for you there. I don't know anybody. I don't have any, 
I, I'm a nobody. I, uh, there's no way I can help you. He said, why don't you do it yourself? And the alien said, we have tried. They said, we sent an emissary to try to negotiate a, a release. They tried to capture the emissary. He success, successfully escaped, got in his ship and took off. They tried to shoot the ship down. He said, they, they're too hostile. We can't deal with them. We're, we're looking for an, uh, another way. And he said, well, how did they crash anyway? And they told him that they, they were lost in the western part of your land, they said in quotes, and that uh, they, the first one they, they lost was a, a big surprise to them. And then they noticed that there was a beam, an energy beam being transmitted in the area there, and they thought that, that it was a new weapon that we had used against them. And uh, when they lost the second one, they became very concerned because they think we're shooting them down, and they, they had even gone to the trouble of contacting other associated space traveling intelligences to consult with them on the nature of retaliation should take for our hostile actions. And while they were doing this, they noticed that the beam continued to operate, that the weapon continued to fire and was running in a circle for, you know, when it was running. And it wasn't named at anybody, and they decided that it was, some, was not a weapon, it wasn't what they thought it was. They calculated, though, that the, the ships went out of control when that beam locked on the ship, on the, the craft, and stayed on for 90 seconds or more, the computer control system would burn out and go into emergency, automatic emergency landing mode. And they didn't have any control of it at all. And uh, they de devised a shielding, a form of shielding, and changed their flight pattern to this sharp angular change in direction that Herman was reporting so that the radar could not lock on and stay on for 90 seconds or more. It couldn't stay on for more than two or three seconds. And they didn't lose any more ships after that. Now more stories of alleged alien contact. And Paul told me on my first visit, and that was what I started with, how did this all begin? And he said that he was a, worked for a power company in California, south of Los Angeles someplace, and that uh, his, his, uh, he was checking power lines and his route was south of Los Angeles along the coast. And he said that he sat down uh, on a, a beach, a rocky beach one time, uh, it was a cove, in a cove to eat a sandwich and a, a man walked up to him, came around the big rock and walked up to him on the beach. He was a tall man, he was about, uh, six and a half to seven feet tall. He was quite a bit taller than Paul. And he uh, introduced himself, gave him a name, and I don't, which I don't remember, and uh, uh, Paul, he asked him where he's from, and he says, not from around here. He said, I, I come from elsewhere. He said, if you will step this way with me, I'll show you my vehicle. And Paul walked around the rock with him, and there was a disc-shaped craft hovering a couple of feet off the water. And the guy uh, took Paul by the hand and, and floated him to the ship. And he was introduced to some others inside and he just remained there a very short time. He, he marveled at the fact that it uh, wasn't in the water. They told him that they would see him again and they let him out. He didn't, never saw him again in California, but uh, a year or so later, he relocated to New Mexico, where he became. He worked for the highway department there, and he was driving a a, uh, a survey truck, a pickup truck. And his particular job was to drive the back roads and look for uh, damage to uh, bridges, rural road bridges. And he carried a Polaroid camera to sh photograph any any damage, because it's easier to show the picture than to try to describe it in a lot of words. And he was in this truck right here that, that he used with the Polaroid camera on the seat when he drove down this dry riverbed. And there's a lot of willows and scrub that grows in there, uh, 30, 40 feet tall. And the road winds around among these. And he came around a turn, and there sat the craft in the sand. There's three women and four men outside. They invited him aboard, and he, he went aboard and looked around with them. They talked to him aboard there for about 15 minutes, telling him who they were and how they had been watching him for some time. That that they uh, they had a special he had a special relationship with them, or they had a special relationship with him. That he uh, had agreed to this uh, these relationships uh, 
sometime much earlier, probably before birth, but he didn't understand it that way. Um, and that uh, uh, there, there was a reason why all this was happening to him. And uh, they didn't have any children aboard. He asked them if they had them. They said yes, but not on this craft. They, that craft came from a larger craft elsewhere in space. They had been coming and going for some time. Uh, they said they had other contactees, but they never told him who the other contactees were, and we've never heard of any of them since. They, they uh, did not encourage him to get any attention over this. They, uh, they kept a low profile. They did contact him on a frequency of maybe two to three times a year, and, and they weren't here all the time. They would come and go. But when they were in the vicinity, they would often make contact with him. My hypothesis is that these people who are driving these UFOs, or at least the people who designed them, have a technology that's more advanced than ours. I mean, I think that's obvious that they're more advanced than our technology. Their technology is so advanced that they have figured out a way to artificially warp space-time the way a black hole does only without all the gravitational effects that rip things apart into their constituent atoms. Mm -hmm. So that they can actually manipulate, they have some sort of a generator in here, so that they can actually produce this field around their craft like a little bubble, a little private universe that they carry around with them. So that they can actually step out of normal space-time into their own private universe and then step back into it at other coordinates. So if that's possible, and they can not only come from all these distant places, but they can also come from parallel universes that coexist with ours and we're not able to see because they're on a different vibrational level or whatever. They can even come, probably, from our own past or our own future. Because as the quantum physicists are telling us now, the past, present, and future are not separate. Our idea of the stream of time is only an art artifact of our consciousness. It is our consciousness that's traveling it isn't that things are happening cause and effect in a linear fashion. It is our consciousness that's doing that. So the past and future actually exist simultaneously with us. And if you're able to warp space time, you can travel to and from them. Time is not linear. In fact, it doesn't exist. It's just a, it's just a concept that we use to describe aspects of space time. And it's, it's an artifact of our consciousness. So this warping of space-time, I think, can explain a great many things about the UFOs. One day in 1975, suddenly and without explanation, a one-armed Swiss farmer named Edward Billy Meyer jumped on his moped and disappeared into the woods outside his village. He returned saying that he had met extraterrestrials and had pictures to prove it. The photographs showed spaceships hovering in the air and Meyer was to take hundreds more photos during his alleged meetings with ETs over the next five years. Were the photographs fake, part of an elaborate hoax, or was Billy Meyer really in contact with visitors from beyond? There's a lot of controversy growing around this case, mostly against it. I was willing to take it because of the photographs. I was willing to get involved in it. I'd been in exchanging photographs with Lou Zinstag for a number of years. Lou Zinstag lived in Basel, Switzerland. She was a niece of Carl Jung, one of the earlier UFO researchers. She published the first journal on UFOs in Europe, in German, out of Basel. And this event, the first events happened in her own backyard. It didn't take long before she heard about them, within a few months. And she went to see Mr. Meyer at his home in, in Hinwell at the time. And he explained how it started, and uh, he showed her the pictures, gave her uh, copies of a dozen of them. And uh, she called me after she got home from that, and she said that uh, she had just uh, acquired a, a few pictures that she thought I really ought to get a look at, that they were, di they were uniquely different because of their uh, extreme sharpness and clarity. And she said, she agreed, that that usually means that they're suspect, that they're done in a laboratory. But she said, I've been to this man's house. He has no laboratory. He lives in a chicken house with a dirt floor. He doesn't have any money at all. He, 
He works as a security guard for a place to live. He gets a small pension from the Swiss government, barely enough to feed his family. Neighbors provide the film for his camera since he took the first pictures. He uses a broken camera that was tossed out by somebody else. She said the, the lens is jammed just short of infinity. And she said he has taken these most remarkable pictures. And she said, I, I'm coming to the States with Timothy Good in a, another month or so. And she said, if you're going to be there, she said, we'll come by Tucson and, uh, and, and I'll show you the pictures. They were, in fact, the best ones I had ever seen up to this time. They were the sharpest, clearest, most beautiful UFO pictures. I decided I've got to go look him in the eye and see for myself how he's doing this. It all started with him when he had been uh, uh, to a, a metaphysical discussion group where they discussed discussed the Rudive and Constantine experiments in, in spirit voices. Meyer decided to try this and he took a tape recorder, which was also a cast off of somebody else's, and he put a tape in it, and put it in his bedroom, closed the doors and left it, wound it back and tried to listen to it, couldn't hear anything. He did it a second time, nothing happened. He decided to give it one more try and then he believed that they were hoaxing the whole thing. So this time, when he wound it back, right at the beginning, when the tape started out, the, the tape said, uh, said, uh, Edward, take your camera and go outside. He turned the tape recorder off, picked up his camera, went out and stood outside with it. Nothing was happening. Looked over at his moped, standing on his kickstand there, and decided to get on it. He pushed it, got the motor going, rode down the road, and he, he rode for, oh gosh, uh, half an hour, just making turns and following his nose, just idly waiting for something to happen. And he ended up in the Frecht Nature Preserve, south of Hinwell. It's a, it's a forest game preserve. He heard a humming whining sound above him, and looking up, he saw a silvery disc-shaped object come out of a cloud and go back into another cloud. And the, and the sound stopped. Then he heard it again, and it came out of the cloud again, and, and he saw it once more, and it went back in the clouds, and the, the noise stopped. Then he heard it a third time, and this time it came out and made a deliberate gliding circle, slow gliding circle down or around over the tops of the forest trees and right down to the meadow where he was standing and, and landed in the meadow a few hundred feet from him. More of the incredible Billy Meyer story when we return. <laughs> Welcome back. We continue now with the incredible Billy Meyer story. This time it came out and made a deliberate gliding circle, slow gliding circle down or around over the tops of the forest trees and right down to the meadow where he was standing and, and landed in the meadow a few hundred feet from him. He started running towards it with his camera. He, did, he took several pictures of it in its descent. And he started running forward it with his camera and, and the closer he got, the more he ran into a resistance. He said the resistance felt like standing in a, in a, a stream with a st swift current. And he said, the closer I got, the stronger the current got, until I reached a point where I couldn't go any further against the current, and I just sat down on the ground and waited. And then a being came out from behind the craft, walking towards him, and uh, it came up to him, and together they walked a few feet back and sat down on the grass, and she identified herself. She said, you may call me Semyasi. She said, I'm not from your system here. But she said, I have a very important message for you, and I want you to remember very carefully. And he said, I have no recorder or no notebook or pencil to take any notes. How, how can I record? How can I remember it carefully? And she said, listen closely, and I'll help you remember it. That's how it all started. And that message was the message pertaining to the, the uh, decay of our ionosphere caused by industrial gases. And she explained to him that they, she, they, they'd come to him in a neutral country, hoping that the neutral country would take a position on saving the atmosphere because neither the war of the Cold War powers were inclined to do so. They were ex the ones that were doing the exploiting. And they hoped that uh, his government would take uh, a, a neutral position and, and seek to stop the action. He said, I don't have any contact with the government. I can't do anything for you. Why don't you go to them? And then she told him a very interesting thing. She said, we have gone to one of your presidents. You know, Switzerland has a, a presidential council. They elect five presidents at a time, and the chairmanship rotates. Every few months, they, change, they rotate 
the presidency, the chairmanship of the president's council. She said, we have gone, we have approached one of your presidents. He didn't tell his wife, he didn't tell any of his colleagues, he has told nobody, and he's keeping the secret entirely to himself, afraid of what, of the consequences of, of revealing it. And she said, that's not doing any good. So she said, uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, she said, the reason we're posing the ships to allow you to take such good pictures is so that somebody will want to know who are they, where are they, where are they from, and what do they want? And we want your government to take this position. And here is the message I want you to, to take down for them. And then she dictated it. And when he was, got home from that meeting, he sat down in his little bedroom and tried to, started to write the message. And then it came through automatic. He was trying to remember what they said when it came through automatically in longhand. And he wrote it rapidly, faster than he can write normally, and under some kind of control. And he wrote, 15 or 20 pages full, and then it stopped. And, and he had the first message, and then he looked at it, he realized that he has gotten the entire communication word by word. So the next time uh, he saw her, she came back, uh, he asked her how they did that, and she said, it's a mechanical device. We, record, we have a device that records not only the conversation, but the thought processes as well. And she said, that can be tuned to transmit it back to you. And she said, that's what we did. As far as I could tell, you know, from looking at it, there, there probably were three major objectives for Semyasi and her team. The first one, or one of them, and I don't know the order of priority, seemed to be her attempt to get Switzerland to uh, take the lead in trying to head off the destruction of the ionosphere by industrial gases, by stopping the industrial processes that were producing the gases that were destroying the ionosphere. A second one, had something to do with the North Sea because several times in Meyer's contact she was called away urgently and had to break off the contact in the middle of it, send him back to the ground and, and race off to head off something that was happening in the North Sea area. We never knew for sure what that was. She told him it was no business of his to know anything about it anyway and she couldn't discuss any of it with him. But we suspect later, we suspected that she was trying to head off the the, the contamination of the bottom of the North Sea by Russian uh, atomic waste dumping. And I don't know how they were doing it. They did have contacts in Russia. So that may have been related. The, the third objective had something to do with uh, something going on in the Yugoslav mountains, and she never would tell him what that was either. And to this day, we don't know what those objectives were. But when they all three failed, she and her team went on to other projects in another solar system in 1980, the end of 1982. No single piece of evidence is conclusive, but it can provide a clue. The challenge is to keep an open mind. Thanks for joining us, and see you next week from Beyond. Waking abruptly in the night, paralyzed, terrified, surrounded by alien creatures, abducted and taken where? A laboratory? Spaceship? Laid out on a table and probed, surgically embedded with implants. Is this reality? Or is it a nightmare from beyond? Good evening, and welcome to From Beyond. I'm Joey Travolta. Tonight, an investigation into the growing phenomenon of alien abduction.
out of nowhere. Flying saucer in the sky. Air an airline and air force pilots. Uh, Our Air Force himself plan. has officially admitted that flying saucers exist. Is there another simulation somewhere? How are we under surveillance by an intelligence that has revealed itself to us? Hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Is life everywhere the same as us? Or are we just one example of a vast array of possible kinds of biochemistry? The paradigm of science is not equipped to handle this Identified flying objects. So believing in them is a matter of communicating with them. It's a very strange and unusual It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle, but it's a puzzle that's worth exploring. has been observed by alien civilizations for at least the past 50 years. Throughout our history, each age in our development is characterized by an ignorance about the scope of possibilities not yet understood, that future generations may look back on with a sympathetic smile of condescension. To us, in the 20th century Earth, this might seem magical, mm -hmm. but I tell people to maintain some sense, if they can, please ask them, to maintain some sense of humility. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to show this video camera, or a hologram, or a laser to someone 300, only 300 Earth years ago, wow. it would appear to be a magic. It would be considered supernatural. Such is the case with UFOs. To us, they represent intangible illusions between fantasy and reality. of 1985, I had a, sh a shocking close encounter that left me uh, completely uh, undone uh, uh, because it appeared to be an encounter with aliens. It was very violent and totally unexpected. Uh, it came into the middle of a life that has, was basically unrelated to the UFO phenomenon in any way. I think that what the whole phenomenon about, is about is the manipulation of the human species for the purposes of alien um, resource taking, yeah. Mm. And that everything else we have is part of the control by which they keep um, this, this agenda within the realm of how they want it presented to us, what they want us to know and deal with, and what they don't want to is pretty much kept from us. I asked them why would they gather in eggs and this, and they, they, they told me they were making a hybrid race. And for what? They did one, I wanted to know for what, but they never, never gave an inkling of what it was for, or what this hybrid race would be doing, where it would be, or what. I spent months trying to understand what had happened to me from a medical standpoint, and eventually concluded that it was unexplained. Uh, I was very frightened by it and began to go out into the woods in the middle of the night to confront those fears. And the result of this was that the visitors returned to my life, and that began what it turn has turned out to be a 10-year relationship with them. Uh, during that period of time, so much has happened outside of my experience. Uh, along the lines of first the crop circles began to come, uh, then uh, uh, Things like the Mexican UFO videos began to be made, and now they're extracting implants from people. There's so much physical evidence of something strange going on that in 1986, I thought I had a medical problem. By 1989, I was fairly sure it was some kind of hallucinatory thing. Now, in 1996, if this isn't dead on real, I'll eat my hat. Only I have one question left. Who's doing this? Aliens or people? I don't know the answer yet. It's almost like they are releasing information on a schedule. We're coming into our own awakening slowly and surely. And the information is being given to us on their schedule.
not on our schedule. And one of the comments I made earlier was that uh, a, a fallacy in, in some researchers' efforts is that they are trying to research superior researchers. They are trying to research superior intelligence. And I'm not sure that our human minds have the capacity uh, to, to comprehend uh, the motives, the objectives uh, of the superior intelligence. I am not content just to remember the experiences that I've been through. I really would like to have official public contact with these beings. I think that the time has come where we have to stop refusing to deal with it. We have to face the issue. We have to get them to come out of hiding however it is that they hide from us and they get away with doing the things that they get away with. We need to deal with them on our terms. After all, this is our world. This is our planet. It's not theirs. <laughs> Disturbing stories of alien abduction are beginning to sound all too familiar. Missing time, bizarre medical experiments, post-traumatic stress. In America alone, over a million people now claim to have been abducted. Why is this happening? And why are so many affected? To investigate this alien abduction phenomenon, we have to look from beyond. The UFO phenomenon has been a part of our lives for the past 50 years. With it comes the possibility that we may finally discover who we are and what we humans might accomplish in a vast cosmos, endowed with intelligence. You know, the problem here is, is in a way, it's the messenger. Here I am, a historian at Temple University, or Bud's an artist, Bud Hopkins, and, and uh, there's uh, Mike Swords, who's at uh, Eastern Michigan, Western Michigan University, you know, and all these people saying these things, that this might be happening, is, you know, well, the fact that we are saying it automatically means it can't be happening because the message is far too big for the messenger. If this were truly happening, we would not be the messengers. The President of the United States, or Secretary General of the United Nations, they would be the messengers, and that would be, mean it wouldn't be happening. So no matter how much we say it, and no matter how much object we say it, that automatically means it can't be happening. An increasing amount of people worldwide are reporting abductions being conducted by alien beings aboard what we describe as UFOs. Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, among others, have been attempting to establish the reasons for what appears to be an extensive biogenetic experimentation being conducted by certain alien life forms currently visiting our planet. We think that the abduction phenomenon began with the onset of the UFO phenomenon. In other words, we think that the abduction phenomenon probably began around the turn of the century and has been with us ever since. Our problem has been uncovering uh, these cases. We have cases from the 30s and a few from the 20s. After that, uh, our knowledge, our first-hand knowledge of it drops off uh, pretty much. However, we feel uh, that the abduction phenomenon from stories about family members and grandparents and great-grandparents, that it probably does start with the UFO phenomenon around the turn of the century. My grandfather died in 1940. So this was in the 1930s when these things were happening with them. She said they would be sitting on the side porch at night and they would see lights over the oil wells. And a lot of times they would see what they thought were little children dressed in white running around oil wells. And on several times, they saw it in the daytime. They would see these little children dressed in white. And once or twice, they got up to go see if they could catch the little children and find out who they were. And they would start out, but by the time they would get there, the children would be gone. We're not exactly totally and completely sure of what is going on with this phenomenon. What we do know is that we're looking at an alien agenda that is based on the physiological exploitation of one species by another species. In other words, people feel that sperm is being taken from them, eggs are being taken from them, babies are being implanted in them and then removed. All of this is for an agenda that uh, is being kept essentially hidden from us. Uh, I look at this phenomenon with a certain amount of alarm. Other people feel that it's more benign than I, than I might feel. 
But whatever it is, uh, it is being kept from us. Uh, I feel that if this were a phenomenon that were ultimately to help us, that we would probably know this and that uh, the abductors would have made this clear, uh, but this is uh, not what has happened, actually. And so um, I'm really uh, very, very disturbed about, about what I've seen. The range of emotions that people ascribe to aliens is very hard to, it's very subjective, but anyway, what they feel is the emotional range of aliens is very, very narrow. They will, they will sometimes feel that they're angry or that they're pleased. Uh, they will sometimes feel that they're actually surprised by what happens uh, or impatient. But uh, you don't get uh, a really wide range of, of emotions. When people feel love radiating from them, which often happens, uh, we really do think that's a controlling uh, issue. I had a, a situation where a woman was in pain. She's on a table. It's various procedures that are being done to her. And uh, she's very angry and she's hurting. And uh, she gets more and more angry and just the head doctor, alien figure, approaches her, puts his hand on her forehead and she just is filled with love. She has never felt. She loves him more than she loves her children. The love is total and complete and cosmic. And no pain, no anger, and he walks away and she starts to hurt again. <laughs> and she starts to get angry again and he comes back and he puts his hand on her and she loves this figure beyond belief. To me, they don't seem to understand emotions because if they had, they would know that women just don't just have sex just to be, you know, with no feelings. So no matter what they could have conjured up or shammed, it still felt like rape. And I don't think they have a concept of that. No one has, uh, that I know has ever reported an alien uh, losing it, so to speak, getting really furious, or no one's has described them sitting around laughing over some story. They, they all seem also to be very, very similar to one another and fascinated by our variety, the richness of, of humanity. I think they're fascinated by the richness of, of humanity, of the human spirit, really. <laughs>
and adults as well. And we feel that the production of these offspring is, is really the, the focus of what this phenomenon is about. Now, the offspring look odd. They look like a combination of alien and human. Uh, most abductees say they look like they're hybrids, for want of a better word. Um, the hybrids uh, have whites in their eyes. Uh, they have a mouth. They have a nose. They still speak telepathically, mostly. Uh, they look sort of human. Some look quite human. Some look more alien. Um, but we know that this has been the, f the focus of the program. This has been it, and people have been describing this from the beginning or certain aspects of it. Even the Barney and Betty Hill case of 1961 had a reproductive aspect to it, both for Barney and for Betty. And uh, this has been a constant uh, since the beginning, and we feel that this is the reason for the abduction phenomenon, and it's the reason for the UFO phenomenon in general. Their main concept was creating a hybrid breed. At least that's what they told me, that they were, gonna, they were trying to create a race of people that could live in our atmosphere and in their atmosphere. And they had not yet produced that person. Now, on another occasion, I remembered being shown a baby that really favored my grandson a lot. If you would, you know, give it to slant eyes, they weren't as big as their eyes, but it looked human. And I knew that this was my child, and I wanted to take that child with me, but they said that it would not be able to live in this atmosphere. Now, I had a case, um, maybe, uh, five or six years ago, where a whole family had been having UFO experiences up on the Cape Cod. Uh, the little girl in the family, five years old, uh, who was not afraid of, of the abduction experiences she was having. And children go up and down. They, for a while, they think it's wonderful and fun, and then they're terrified of it, and they change. It. Most people change, too. But anyway, uh, she said that this little man came in and that she sees, and and but he had with him a little girl who didn't look human. Didn't, um, she said, didn't look like us and didn't look like him. Looked like a mix, and she had white hair, as this little girl described it, meaning very, very pale blonde hair. And the man said, we have to go, uh, you have to come with us, we have some friends waiting. And she said, so we all three went out, we went right through the wall, mommy, and you don't even get splinters, and uh, you don't even get dirty. And they went to a playground in on the Cape, uh, and I think it was, I'm trying to remember the town, Pirates perhaps. But anyway, uh, she said they must have been playing baseball because all the lights were on. This is a playground with no lights. But anyway, waiting for them were another group, uh, another nine little children. And she described them to her mother as, she said they were all twins. Uh, but she was upset because they didn't say hello to her, they didn't talk to her, and they didn't smile at her. But the basic point was that the, uh, alien figure told her he'd brought her there to play on the swings and slides and teach the children how to play. They had to see how to play. And so she got on the swing and so forth, but she wanted the children to play with her. And he said, no, they have to watch you and learn how to play. Now, uh, and then when all this was over, they took her back. But the basic point here is that suggests to me the, t the ultimate desire to live amongst us. I don't know how, any other way to, to uh, interpret that. Uh, and so it would seem to me, whether they're physically capable of doing that or not, perhaps some of them are and some of them are not, for various reasons of God knows, nourishment, uh, air, who knows. Uh, but it would seem that that's the goal. Now, whether that's a peaceful, natural process or not, I, no one knows. <laughs> If all the alleged abductees are crazy, how come there's so many of them? Why are their stories so hauntingly similar? Why do so many appear normal and have no history of hallucinations or mental illness? First, I, I wanted to assume that I was crazy, right? But there was too much evidence to the contrary. For instance, I had scoop marks on my chin, and I don't remember how they got there, but other people remember aliens taking little instruments and scooping out pieces of skin. Hundreds of other abductees 
who don't know each other, who live in different parts of the world, who have not communicated with each other. It's like, I found out when I first started undergoing hypnotherapy, you know, I would tell John Carpenter what was happening to me. What I didn't know is that 47 other people who didn't know each other were telling John Carpenter the same thing. Why are these people saying this now? You know, why in the 1990s and 80s are people thinking that it's okay to imagine that they had, you know, why not 1970s? Why not, you know, in other words, it's an interesting research question, and it is affecting many, many lives, and so we should be studying it. Now, it, it is true that psychologists, they are studying it to a certain extent, but I think that, that, that there has been in the past, and even today still, a stigma attached, you know, to maybe taking it seriously like that. And I, I could dream up many, many other areas of science where, in fact, the scientific establishment view um, just uh, r uh, suppresses the um, chance to do research in areas, and of course ufology is a, is a prime example of that, definitely. What I always state about this phenomenon is that uh, taken together, the collection of all the photographs, the videotapes, uh, the accounts that I've been mentioning, the ground traces, the physical marks of people's bodies, the descriptions of the events in the craft, and etc., etc., the sightings, all of that constitutes an extraordinary phenomenon. And I think it is indisputable that an extraordinary phenomenon demands an extraordinary investigation. To continue to dismiss the UFO phenomenon may very well be ignoring the most profound occurrences of our times. In our struggle to achieve technological dominance of the physical world, we have endangered not only ourselves, but countless other living forms. And in the process, we seem to have lost a profound sense of our place in the cosmos. The paradigm of science is not equipped to handle this phenomenon. Sociological reasons, threat, denial, psychological reasons, economic reasons, political reasons, military reasons. It's not a scientific issue. Well, there is no scientific formula. For, for, for looking into this phenomenon. I mean, it is absolutely bizarre. I would never dare write a second book on the subject. I mean, if I'm going to have any credibility as a writer, this has got to be it. And, I, and I'm going to go off, and then I am. You know, as I said, I'm doing a, a book on the Mayo Clinic, which is hardly paranormal. But the abductees are what struck me. And because they came forward as, as Mac had put it so timidly, so reluctantly, so terrified of getting any publicity when they found out I was there for, in theory, the New Yorker. I never did it for the New Yorker, as it turned out. Uh, but I was media. They, they were like the feral cats I have in the back here. I would come and they would flee. Uh, so there was a, an enormous amount of time spent winning their trust which is not true of somebody who wants to go on Oprah. You know, the last thing in the world these people want is publicity. Those who have had encounters have to find some way to get up every morning and go about their day knowing that this is a reality. And one of the ways to do this is to make it benevolent, to make it scientific, to make it anything but threatening. And when we look at the real events going on and the real results of these events going on in the scenario, that is not a very tenable position to take. It is simply the one we choose for our comfort rather than what intellectually, objectively, we are observing because that's too frightening. And that bothers me the most in ufological research that no one is answering the big questions. Who are they? Where they come from is not even a big question, but why they're here and what they want are big questions. And we get caught up exploring the trivia of this phenomena rather than dealing with those questions. Nothing else is more important than those questions. What's important to me is that I think people understand is that our planet is one that's filled with such fear. We have fear of everything. And this is a focal point for fear. When you're dealing with someone coming in through your walls and taking you out of your bedroom to a strange uh, spacecraft and doing things to your body, 
and it makes you want to go inside and, and to understand what is this place, who are we, why are we here, what is this happening? Why do some people see the spaceship and others don't? I don't know why. I really think it has to do with us going inside and saying that there's something more going in here than what meets the eye. And we have to go inside ourselves to understand what's going on. There's a self-exploration here that opens one, that will open up one to other dimensions, other realities, and other possibilities. This place is not about money markets, picket fence, getting a car, and getting the best job. There's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. <laughs> Who are these abductors? What do they want? Why don't they reveal themselves openly? Whitley Strieber said it years ago. He said, these beings are the true architects of the secrecy. They could break this open anytime they want to. They choose not to for whatever reason. I do make some theor theoretical uh, constructs to help me mm -hmm. test and deal with the material, but I haven't yet to publish or to state a conclusion. I do not have a yeah. conclusion that I don't think anyone who has one right now should be believed or listened to because there's still too much we haven't sorted through. But my take on it at this point, and this is personal but based on evidence from my case, my family's, and uh, many, many other cases, is that we are a resource, we have long been a resource for these entities that they not only take physically from us, they take emotionally and spiritually from us, and that it is not for our benefit. We are a resource for their benefit. And I think there's a change in the relationships in the last several years between the, the crop and the, the harvester, if you will, because the crop is developing new awarenesses. <laughs> subject of UFOs is part of the subject matter of some courses that I teach. Okay. So it, it's got academic credibility in the community. Yeah. At least as far as I'm concerned, the evidence is, is really overwhelming that extraterrestrials are here. It's hard, after you see five weeks of that, that material, it's really hard not to have that opinion, I think. There is enough evidence to make me believe it might be true. You know, missing time that does seem to be verified by other people. I'm not that impressed by scoop marks and scars. But I am impressed by people's reports of, oh, waking up with me with their underwear on backwards, things like that. Why am I, it sounds silly, why am I impressed by that? Because I don't know of any normal people for which that ever happens. I've never talked to anybody who was not an abductee, who just said, spontaneously, I woke up and my, my, my pajamas were on backwards. That just doesn't happen, as far as I know. The missing time experiences, well, one, one story which maybe should be, you can put on tape, but it's, uh, I mean, this is a, a, a kind of sadly funny story, and it comes from a psychologist who's been doing some very good work on this subject in Washington. But a man had come to him because of some experiences, but he began to remember an earlier thing uh, where he had been uh, in college at the time, and he and a couple of other guys had come to some town, I think for a football game or whatever, I've forgotten it. But they were staying in a Holiday Inn, and it was a hot night, and they were sitting around their underwear watching television and drinking beer. And he stepped out on the balcony and felt real funny, and uh, when he went to get back in, the door was locked, the glass. So he's banging, you know, and his curtain was drawn. Okay, come on, you guys, you know, this sort of thing. And um, finally, the curtains part, and there's this elderly man looking out. And uh, he doesn't know what's going on, and the man's very frightened. And there's a woman in bed, an old, older woman background and he doesn't know what's happening and pretty soon a security guy is called by these folks and they let him security man lets him in and uh, he's now on the sixth floor had been on the 12th floor balcony and uh, he's in his underwear going through some stranger's <laughs> bedroom this is the place where the ba balconies don't uh, interconnect and uh, from that point on he was called spider-man by his uh, friends but uh, uh, now, how do you have an experience like that and some of the other things and not begin to think there's something wrong? A lot of people just think these are normal. Well, I know that, that 
it was physical because if I did not get out of that car, where did I get all that dirt that was up to here on me? If I just stepped out of the car and looked up because we were on pavement. So it's no way that I could have got that much dirt on me just standing outside a car on the street looking. And that's the first thing that let me know that it was real. And beside this not, which might be, you know, it, it, you could say that it could be anything. Uh, the bruises are real. Nobody is beating me up in my sleep. Because if anybody hit me that hard, I would wake up. And the places where I have the bruises, I couldn't give them to myself. And like I said, if I bumped into something that hard, I would certainly remember it. So it's real to me. You know, about two out of every three abduction claims basically emerge under hypnosis. And so that, you know, that presents a set of problems. You know, then there's murky controversies about false memory. And, and um, so the abduction phenomenon, in, 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 there are some cases that are really interesting and intriguing. But there are others that simply, you know, exist only in memory and testimony and seem unconnected with anything else. So I think that it's probably risky to, at this state, to go too far with this. I think that what we had better do is keep our minds open and our investigations busy and intense until we have more information. <laughs>
I was picked up and threatened at gunpoint by our military, and I was told that I must never talk about what was happening to me or they would kill me. This was back in 1991, and I believed them. You know, I've never had anybody stick a gun to my head before and say, if you talk, we'll kill you. But that's not the only time that I was captured by the military. There have been other experiences in which I have remembered just little bits and pieces. I've remembered being in a military hospital and having an x-ray machine scan my body. I remembered being given drugs. I remember having my arms strapped down onto tables so that I couldn't move and being given injections. I remember the um, military doctors doing something to my right ear, which I find this interesting too. Prior to that procedure, I heard Morse code type beeps in my right ear. After that procedure, I did not. However, after that procedure, I started hearing Morse code type beeps in my left ear. And I still hear those beeps in my left ear. Wherever I am, Whenever it's quiet, I hear Morse code type beeps. When you take a person who has remembered alien experiences under hypnosis, remembers an implant being put in their leg, they're x-rayed, the implant is seen, and then it's removed by a doctor, and that has happened? You can't tell me that's not real. It is real. The only question is, was the hypnosis accurate in the sense of who put it there? Certainly the lady remembered where it was under hypnosis. The x-ray confirmed its existence. But who did she remember under hypnosis who really put it there or not? We don't know because we don't know the effect of the implants and we don't know whether or not if you got past all of the interference you wouldn't find soldiers putting it into her. Or uh, it might be there really are aliens out there doing it. We just can't be sure of anything right now. This is a time not for answers, but for questions. Let me see an example. I'm on an airplane. I mean, this is why these things come up. I'm on an airplane, and this woman's sitting next to me, and she starts talking. And this is a woman in her 40s, and you know, right? Actually, turns out has a very big job. She's the she was the um, in charge of placement for a major law school. So she's dealing with you know Supreme Court judges and all this, and. Uh, then she asked me, what are you doing? Uh, is this business a pleasure? And finally, out comes, I'm yeah. going to give a lecture, and I think, holy shit, no, I'm going for it, you know. And uh, she said, well, oh, that's very interesting. She said, I don't know anything about that, but do you get ridiculed or anything? And I said, no, not really, you know, I'd be surprised. And she said, well, I had a very unusual experience once, uh, but every time I told people about it, uh, they, you know, ridiculed me. And she said, but, uh, so I don't tell anybody anymore. And I said, well, what was your experience? And she said, well, I, it was, I saw a ghost. Well, this is the experience very quickly. She's asleep with her boyfriend, visiting some people. There's a cemetery like a mile away, you know, that's the setting. Uh, she wakes up. She doesn't know why she wakes up. She can't move. She's paralyzed. And she's really scared because she can't, doesn't know what's happened to her. Coming right through a closed door is a ball of light about this big, a perfect sphere. It comes about, you know, like four feet, three feet across the floor. It comes right over to her, scares the hell out of her. This is the ghost, incidentally. And it just goes from her feet, goes right up her body, like it was looking at her, to her head, then it goes back down, and then it goes over to the boyfriend and goes up, you know, and blah, 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 and then out, and then leaves, and also she can move. Now, this woman had no inkling that she has probably an abductee. How would you have an experience like that? A sphere of light that comes in? Interesting description of the light. It was incredibly bright, but it didn't illuminate the room. It seemed like the light was somehow magically self-contained, which everyone describes. It's the, people will say it, it looks like it should be hard on your eyes. It's so bright, but it doesn't seem to get outside itself. And uh, the movement and the deliberateness of it and all that. Uh, she had some other stuff, too. I didn't say anything, but there are people all over the place. I dealt with one recently. She's became Pentecostal and religious and all this because she thought demons were after her woman whose uh, elderly mother got the priest over to bless the house because of holy water, because uh, demons were coming through the walls at night sometimes. And so people just put these things someplace. It's not really a, a, a frightening, frightening experience. It's just, it happens, and it doesn't leave you 
frightened. I think the thing that frightened me the most was that I was not consciously aware of what had happened. And I did not know what to put these ships with. I didn't have anything concrete to say, well, they're coming to do this or that. I just had the frightening feeling. And after I found out what had happened, I was at peace with what had happened, knowing that there's nothing that I can do about it. Because I cannot stop them. Nobody can stop them from doing what they want to do. Nobody on this earth. Because they are too far advanced mentally and technologically for we don't have a defense at all. Yeah, like they do magic. Yeah, they could come in today and take over if that was their desire. But like I said, I don't feel that it's their desire to take over through violence, and they don't care about government. See, government control is not their thing. They want bodies, and they want minds that are going to do what they want the minds to do, but they need the bodies to do whatever it is with. And that's where we come in. I think we're asking the right questions. And, and this has got to continue. I mean, if we let the curiosity, uh, the anger and frustration that these people feel die out, then, then you're doing it as all a disservice. Because we come back to the most important question. What if it is true? then what are we doing about it? We may not ever know the entire truth behind the aerial abduction phenomenon, but one thing seems clear. Until things are taken seriously, it's not going to go away. Thank you for joining us, and good night.